take a whole lot more for them to start all students in grade nine instead of staggering them when they turn 16. So that's something you can advocate for, at least for your individual child, if not for all of the students in your particular district. So I want to go back to the Transition Bill of Rights. The primary reason for this Transition Bill of Rights is because families were not being informed of one of the very special ways that Connecticut interprets transition. IDEA says that you can stay in school until you reach the age of 21 or you receive a regular high school diploma. Connecticut is one of the few states in the country that has interpreted that to mean also if your child has not met their transition goals and objectives, the PPT can decide the student can hold their diploma, refuse their diploma, and the diploma is held for them, and they can go on for transition-only services as long as the PPT decides that's appropriate which for many students who have to work really hard to get that diploma and don't have a lot of other time to spend on transition skills, this is often a gift for them and something that they really need in order to be successful. When I came on board 12 years ago and found out this was how Connecticut interpreted this law, I had to fight a lot with districts. Now I have districts complaining because the kids want to leave early and they want the students to stay. So many of them, again, not all of them, but many of them understand that this is a critical need for many students with disabilities, and in particular, for students who are on the spectrum who may need this. So I wanna go over this a little bit just to kind of show you what's here, because this is the only place that transition services, anything about transition-only services is written down. So, <laughs> I'm going to start with the students with an IEP have a right to um, receive, as I said before, secondary transition services starting at age 16 or younger if the PPT decides until they turn 21 and the way that's defined, a school year goes from July 1st through June 30th. So if a student turns 21 on June 30th, they're done when their school year ends that June. But if they turn 21 on July 1st or any time thereafter, they can go an additional year. They're still going to be 21 when they graduate, but they can have an additional year. And this is now in legislation. Um, we talk about attended PPT meetings. Um, they have a right to understand their accommodations and modifications. Um, one of the things that we have to talk about and I'm sure the others will talk about it this afternoon, is there are no modifications in the real world. So if your students are getting modifications, which means they're changing the amount or quality of work a student has to do so they're doing less than everybody else, then you're setting them up for failure. Accommodations, on the other hand, are modifications in time, in format, um, extended time readers and instructive technology, uh, adaptive technology, um, things that make the same tasks easier for a student with a disability. Those are permitted both in school and work and in college. But again, the more accommodations and support a student gets while they're in high school, the less independent they may be. And that's something you really want to seriously look at to say where they're going, are they going to be able to do this? If the answer is no or, you know, it might not fly well, then you want to try and remove that, even that accommodation sometimes, to see if they can do it on their own. And most of the time they can. Often they need a little bit more time or some ways to do use technology, but they often can do those kinds of things on their own. Developing realistic goals and objectives. And now we have a lot of students who come in who have unrealistic goals about what they want to do when they leave high school, and that's okay. They're adolescents. We all have those goals. 
So helping them look at whether it's a good match or a good fit and what they need to get there and whether they have the skills and abilities to do that or can get the skills and abilities to do that, that's what we're looking for. Um, helping with their annual goals and objectives. I gave you another document called the Core Transition Skills, which I'll show you in a minute. How many of you have heard of the Connecticut Common Core Standards or the Connecticut Core Standards? These are standards that are national that Connecticut has adopted in English, language arts, and math. These core transition skills are like our, our standards in transition. And they have been available to all school districts for at least the last seven or eight years. We encourage districts to use these to write annual goals and objectives. So this is a really important document for you to look through and kind of look at those areas that your student, your child, or yourself can do and what skill areas you might need assistance in. And they're areas, so you have to break those down into measurable goals and objectives in terms of the annual goals. We also, in number eight, gives you a lot of the state agency services, outside agencies that can be invited. Um, just to invite them is not really appropriate because most of those state agencies will not come when asked blindly to attend a meeting for a student they don't know. So the student has to be in the beginnings of some kind of an eligibility process getting to know the agency before they will actually be able to come and attend a meeting. So if the school says to you, well, I invited them, but they didn't want to come, that may be because they haven't started that conversation with the agency about is this student eligible for your services. The other thing to think about is um, on the IEP it says that the student has to be informed before age 17 that the rights that are uh, for the parent at this point in time will shift over to that student at age 18. So it sometimes has a family who needs a little bit of time to think about are we going to do power of attorney, guardianship, conservatorship, et cetera, uh, across the board in certain areas. So these are difficult decisions for a family to make, especially if you have a student who isn't severe, doesn't have a severe disability, it's even harder to make those decisions about can my child be independent in all of these areas or do they need some help? But once a child turns 18, the school cannot deal with you unless you have power of attorney, guardianship, conservatorship. They have to deal with the student, except for one issue, and this is now in the legislation. If the student writes a statement that says something like, I, the student, put their name, give my permission for my parents, whomever, to act on my behalf educationally, they sign and date it, that is sufficient. So that will work for a child who's 18, and they can withdraw that permission at any time. But that's an important conversation to have. Because sometimes we have students who think they can do this all on their own, and maybe they really can't. But you can give them some time to kind of play around with that and see if they do need some more help down the road. So that's in the IEP too. So this section, starting at number 10, is where we actually talk about those transition-only services. And these are really important for families to know because this is not a right, but it is something that you can request through the PPT. It's not an automatic. So the first thing is students have to have met all of their academic requirements for graduation before they can participate in a transition-only program. That doesn't mean there won't be worksite experiences and internship programs that they can participate in while they're working on their diploma in their high school. These are just the transition only services of which there are probably over 150 of them in the state. There are a pocket of them that are run by districts. There are some that are run by community providers. There are three that are run by colleges, so a student can have graduated and still participate in these transition-only type programs. Um, and there are some that are run by approved private special ed programs. And there are directories of all of these programs on the State Department of Ed's website. Particularly if you go to our homepage, there's a little blue box on the left-hand side that says Ed Site. 
E-D-S-I-G-H-T. If you click on there and go under Find the School District, you'll see in the left-hand side transition programs and they'll all be listed there. Um, the PPT has to make this recommendation. It can't be something that just comes from a family. Um, and it has to be a coordinated set of activities. It doesn't have to be a program. Now the 150 that I mentioned do happen to be programs, but if you're a small school district, you don't have a program, you have one student who wants transition-only services, you can support them in taking a college course. You can hire an outside agency to develop an individual internship program for them, and then maybe hire another organization that will work on social skills with them. That's a coordinated set of activities. Your child does not have to be in a program. Because sometimes a program is like trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. So you have to look like, just like any other time you look at goals and objectives, the most important thing for transition only is you identify the goals and objectives that a student wants to work on. Then you look at where can those goals and objectives happen. It might be a program, it might not be. And sometimes what you have is a district who has just started a program. And I find this a lot for students on the spectrum. Very often these programs are started for students who have more significant cognitive disabilities. And it may or may not be appropriate for a student on the spectrum. So you have to be very clear about what your child's goals are and whether or not those are the goals of that program or that program can modify their services to meet your child's goals. That's the only way you will be able to find the right program for your child. Right? They can't force you into their program. It may end up going to mediation or hearing in, in order to determine that. But the most important thing is, for example, you say my child wants to go on to college this program does not provide that kind of an experience for students. So therefore, that program may not be appropriate for your particular child. And I've coached a lot of parents through this process, and if you're very clear about what your child wants to learn, and then look at what the program offers, it's pretty much a no-brainer. Um, <clears throat> okay. The other thing is these programs have to be 80% time with non-disabled peers. So when I first started, we had some programs that got a, a room on a college campus and they spent the whole day in that room. That's just a segregated program on a college campus. That's not 80% time with non-disabled peers. I would have to say probably 95 to 99% of our programs are 80% time with non-disabled peers. Those that aren't might be through the approved private special ed programs where you have students with more significant disability related needs and they're working towards that 80%. So many of these programs may meet as a group for a half an hour a day, maybe an hour a day, maybe they meet on Fridays um, and the rest of the time they should be out in the community and worksite experiences, participating in the gym on campus if they're on a campus or the Y or whatever. Um, so they should be, programs should be 80% time with non-disabled peers and a peer is someone the student's age or older. So if you have a program in a high school, number one, they're not going to be with their peers because they're all, most of them are going to be under 18. And so they're not going to be with non-disabled individuals either because if they're with each other, they're only with people with disabilities. So that's why we encourage these transition programs to be as much out in the community as possible. The other thing to know is that, and this is in legislation now, that the child who is going into a transition only program, the PPT can make the decision whether the student will participate in the graduation and senior activities of the class that they're currently in, and then the diploma will be held until they exit or they can wait and participate when they actually exit. So that's a decision the team can make. And most students choose to participate with their peers um, who are finishing up their academic credits at the same time they are. 
but the date on the diploma for the student in a transition only program will be the date that they exit high school. Okay, it might be a semester, it might be a year, it might be two years, it might be three years. That will be the date that's on their diploma. Okay, those are the criteria. The other recommendations are that transition services should only typically be discussed in the last year or so of a student's high school career. All students are expected to graduate in four years. We have what we call a four-year graduation cohort rate. If they do not, if the PPT decides in the end of their junior year, beginning of senior year, we really think the student needs more services, they will not meet that four-year four, or four-year graduation cohort rate, which the districts aren't too happy about. But the good news is we have a six-year graduation cohort rate and they will most likely be in that rate. So it's not like they're not going to be graduating at all. Um, so we don't want parents coming in in their freshman year saying, we only want to focus on academics, we'll do transition after they finish their senior year. That can't happen. By law, you have to be addressing transition. So that I would recommend that you do as much as you can do, get as much transition as you can between 16 and their senior year, and then look at, do we need additional services? So it's not an automatic. Um, typically, students who are transition-only programs, we urge them not to be in their high school, because the theory is, when you're in one of these programs, where would you be doing these tasks if you were graduated? So the one I like to use a lot is, where would you do your laundry if you were an adult who graduated? You're not going to go to the consumer science classroom and do your laundry there. You're going to go to a laundromat. Um, same thing with transportation. Hopefully you won't be taking a yellow bus to your work site experience. Now, that being said, some districts, that's the only way they can transport students. So that is permissible, but they should also be learning about public transportation, Uber, riding bikes, you know, being careful about ex accepting rides, not hitchhiking, those kinds of things, in order to take some independence for their own transportation. So you can have a student who can be taking a course in a high school. I had a situation where there was a young man who had cerebral palsy and he wasn't able to communicate very well. And they kept working on that communication aspect. And finally, in his senior year, the mother found some kind of technology that would work for him and he was able to communicate. Now, they were going to put him in a very low-level job type situation. They found out this kid could go to college but he hadn't been able to communicate with them, so they didn't know what he knew and how smart he was. So he remained in the school to take college prep courses that he wasn't able to take before. That's kind of an unusual situation. So you might have a student who takes one course um, that might not be available somewhere else, but it's not for credit and it's not for graduation. But for the most part, they should be taking courses at a college, continuing education in the adult education program, learning how to make a brick wall at Home Depot. Wherever we as adults would go to learn, that's where students in transition-only programs should be doing their learning, not within the high school walls. Okay, so number 11 talks a little bit briefly about something called the Student Success Plan, which you need to be aware of. In 2012, legislation was passed that said every student in grades 6 to 12 has to have a student success plan, including those with disabilities. So if your child is on an IEP or has a 504 plan, they also should have a student success plan, which looks at three areas, academics, career, and social, emotional, and physical development. It is a general ed transition plan, if you will. Typically, it's done through school counseling or guidance. Um, but if your child's on an IEP, you want to know what's in the student success plan so you're not working on different goals. So the career goal in both of those areas should be similar. Um, so if 
student success plan is not mentioned at your PPTs, you need to ask where it is and can you see a copy of it? And is it in alignment with your child's IEP or 504 plan? And you can click on that link and it'll tell, it'll tell you a whole lot more about student success plan. And then the last non, number 12 just gives you a whole number, a whole bunch of resources, many of which are in Spanish that are on the State Department of Ed's website that are about transition. So you have plenty of uh, late night reading material. So when we think about transition, I, I used to call it connecting the dots. Because we as adults have many different components to our lives. So this cannot be left up to the school because the school doesn't have a lot to do with their religious community or their community experiences or what goes on in the family. Um, so all of this is, as I said before, ha is a responsibility of not only the school districts because it's in our legislation, but also families and community members to help these students connect the dots so that they can be more successful in the real world once they exit high school. So I'm not gonna go through these, but these are six teams of the core transition skills. We have a 42 member transition task force that's made up of all the state agencies, parents, advocates, everybody on there, and students with disabilities, and they put together these 16 areas that students should at least address, and they are now working on another document that will break these areas down for students with significant disabilities and students with mild disabilities. There are assessments that can measure these skills um, and they're tied into the Common Core State Standards. So there's a lot of resources out there for districts that connect the dots, at least as far as the kinds of transition skills students need to be learning. So no longer should transition goals be throwing spaghetti against the wall and seeing what sticks. And you have a separate document on that. So this is one of my favorite sayings, and some people get it and some people don't. Throughout your child's life, or particularly in school, you should be looking at all activities through a transition lens. So let's take the adage of tying your shoes. It's a lot, a lot easier sometimes for a parent to try the, tie their child's shoes than, than to teach them how to tie their shoes. So you may have a child who can never learn to tie their shoes. So do they not wear shoes? No, you give them slip-ons or Velcro, okay? So even academics are transition skills because I can't think of too many jobs that don't require some level of reading, writing, or math. So knowing what the students' levels are in academics is transition assessment. Uh, interests are transition assessments and then all of the other skills that go along with it. So every activity that you do at home, in the community, um, all of these things should be looked at, at through a transition lens. And this is what I tell the schools and the districts and I tell families the same thing. So I just wanted to uh, highlight a couple of things that you as families can do to help this process along. One of the most important things is helping your child to understand their disability in terms of disability terms, because if you think they don't know they have a disability, you're wrong, they know, even if you don't call it a disability. It needs to be tied to the legislation that protects their rights as a person with a disability, and they need to know what those are. They need to know their strengths and weaknesses, and when they need help, and what kind of help they need, what kind of accommodations they need. They also need to know, particularly students on the spectrum, when you tell somebody your whole life story and when you just ask for an accommodation. Okay, so you need to know how much to tell who, and that's a tricky thing, even for somebody without a disability. Um, fostering independence, decision making, goal planning, goal setting, all of those are critical skills that you can work on as families and exposing them to a range of opportunities after high school. Sometimes the problems with students and picking career paths is they're not exposed to a whole lot. So asking them what their neighbors do, just having them visit various places and saying, well, look at all the different jobs you can have in this place. You know, you might go to the um, Cape Cod, uh, 
potato chip factory up in, up at the Cape, or I went to Mystic Aquarium one time just to look at the kinds of jobs they have at Mystic Aquarium. Not to visit the animals, but to see what kind of jobs. And you could do everything from sell popcorn to clean the seal cage uh, or the seal area. Um, involving students in PPT meetings. I am thrilled when I hear that parents are bringing their kids at a young age, even if it's just for the beginning, so they get used to sitting in a room with people talking about them and to them. Because it's very intimidating when you sit around a table and you've got eight to 10 people there talking about what you're doing in school. But it's a really important skill to learn and they won't know how to advocate for themselves at PPT meetings down the road if they don't get used to that particular process. Helping them set realistic goals or explore goals that aren't realistic and looking at plan A, plan B, and plan C. So if you wanna be an NBA basketball player, that's your plan A. You decide, okay, that's not gonna work. Um, I'm gonna do something else to put food on the table, but maybe I can coach rec basketball, or maybe I can be a coach at the junior high level or at the high school level, or maybe I can play basketball at the YMCA. So it's not giving up that dream of being involved with basketball, but how do you, um, how do you make that work in terms of your planning? Um, transportation we talked about, and one of the huge ones these days is how students communicate. Students communicate these days with their thumbs. They don't know what nonverbal communication is. So that's a huge one that families can help students to understand and what they're saying to people even though they're not verbalizing things. So I'm not gonna go into all of this. These are some resources you can look at, but I wanna strongly encourage you to go to the DDS website. There's something called Life Course Planning, which is a very simple person-centered planning approach that families can just take a form and learn to do. So I encourage you to look at these forms and um, that information on that website. And then there are a number of other resources around Connecticut with some dates of some meetings that you can participate in to learn more about transition. And at the very end, all of the links to those websites are there. And I was told to tell you that if you have questions specific for me, since I am retired, to send them to info at asrc.org. That's info at ct dash asrc.org and they will collect them and get them back to me.